Hello and welcome to Bloke on the Range and we're here in Finland at uh, Varstalika, courtesy of Varstalika. Thank you very much for hosting us and we have a certain gentleman here who if you're watching Bloke on the Range, if you don't recognise, where have you been? <laughs> Excellent to uh, have you. Bonjour, merci. And uh, we're going to have a topic today which is a bit of a redux of something that we were discussing first time we met. We were wandering around St. Gallen talking about French stuff. And you remarked, we should have just filmed this, <laughs> which was a fair comment. We were fa fa failing to find a, a suitable uh, restaurant. This that is true. Yeah. Um, finally, we succeeded, but this was back in 2017. This is something like that. Yeah, it was a long time ago. Long yeah. time ago. And we also, us two also tried to do it. Yes, once we did. During ski holiday, we thought, right, we'll sit down around fondue and and it do didn't. it. It didn't. <laughs> it didn't happen. So we have a genuine Frenchman. We have a genuine Francophile who has written a book <laughs> entitled uh, Chasseau to Famas, French Military Rifles 1866 to 2016. So what we're going to talk about is the fact that the French military and French arms development could be simultaneously very forward looking and extremely backwards at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, indeed. Like, through the entire period, pretty much, of <laughs> the coverage of, uh, of your book there. The book, yeah. So, um, yeah, just before we begin, quick note, we've all been nasally brain probed. We're all, we're all clear of, uh, of plague. Of nasties. So, uh, also, also, we have beverages. Also, yeah. we have beverages. So, so uh, thank you to Barstalika for providing re refreshment. Indeed. Um, mm. So, um, I'm more or less going to moderate this because these are the two experts. <laughs> Um, and we're just going to sort of see where it goes and it's free form and we have no major time constraints so this could go on for a while. Mm. You know, I think the subject is almost perfectly represented just by the label itself. Yes. Which is simultaneously yeah. the first smokeless powder military rifle mm. and an absolute game changer in military technology and at the same time the, it, it, it's obsolete within three years. Yeah. The Mauser 1889 comes out, and the Lebel is immediately obsolete. Or even the um, the commission rifle, the Gewehr 88, yeah, knocks it right. out of the water because it's meters. got it's not a tube magazine, and it's got right. packet loading. Yeah. yeah, they simultaneously have this fantastic new powder, and then decide to utilize it with uh, a magazine system that's already obsolete, and they know it. Well, I mean, this this was a bureaucratic decision of we want this now. And we did a long video on this well, ages ago. One, it was uh, Boulanger that decided. Right. Right, right. I want it now. Right. So, so they took the path of absolute least resistance. Yeah. Which was the only one open yeah. to them. You can't yeah. blame this on the no. designers. They were presented with basically an impossible This task. is the deadline. Right. You have six months <laughs> to <laughs> develop yeah. a new rifle using a completely new technology. Yeah. Go. Yeah. And, they, and they, because they went in full whack, uh, they developed the extremely efficient assembly lines, modern for the time, which meant they produced three million of these <laughs> rifles yeah, yeah. in a very short space of time. Right. Because they, you know, well like, before World War One, they had finished. They'd like done three or four years. <laughs> yeah. And given the number that survived World War One, tells you how many there were yeah. in the first place. Yeah, given that they had stopped producing them. Right, and they exactly. did not re well. They basically didn't restart producing them during World War One. They yeah. assembled. <laughs> well, it also says something that they assembled what they had left of leftover parts and came up with like 200,000 more yeah. rifles <laughs> from leftover parts. So, so yeah, it, it's hard from that position to say, all right, let's, let's, start, let's start again and come up with something else. Right. <laughs> Which is then why we get the, the Bertier with, okay, we've got this for this very specific task for the cavalry. Right. And then, yeah, we'll just stretch it a bit. And then we'll stretch it a bit more, <laughs> and then we'll stick a box on it. And then, oh crap, <laughs> we can't start making labels, but we need more rifles for the war now, so let's yeah. just give it to the infantry. And this was, uh, well, I think basically from that stage, we have the uh, developers interrupt us. <laughs> <laughs> Every time, we just can't oh, quite get oh, it done. Yeah. All right, we're going to go for a new system. War were declared. All right, we'll get over this one. Yeah. All right, so, let's go again. <laughs> so we'll, co we'll cover a lot of this, but um, I'd just like to take a step back in time because your book starts at the Chaspeau. Mm -hmm. First model, 1866. 66. 66. Yeah. That's a bit late for a needle fire. It is. Yeah. Um, I think there was a, a notion 
and this is justifiable at the time, although it would obviously prove to be a mistake, <laughs> that metallic cartridge production was a potential choke point for military supply. Yeah. We're transitioning from the, the muzzle loading era of all you have to do is basically supply lead and powder. And like guys can mold their own bullets in the field, no big deal. But if all of a sudden you have this metallic case and a primer, now what happens if you run out of ammunition? You can't supply yourself in the field anymore. What happens if like something happens to the one cartridge factory that existed at the time? Yeah. Now we're in you know deep trouble. The paper cartridge gives us it's like it's a nice compromise. It gives us the the benefits of a, a in this case a a um, caseless, effectively, breech-loading rifle. It's fast, it can still be accurate, it's high velocity for the time, but it can also be very easily fabricated by children. Uh, probably, Cheap labor. yes. <laughs> cigarette, cigarette manufacturers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's also a misconception that uh, the adoption was rushed. No, uh, the adoption of the yeah. Chasse Poe wasn't rushed Exactly, at all. It's, it's often perceived as because I guess that there's a short timeline between the official adoption and the 1870s war. Hmm. So people make the connection, whereas in fact, the Chaspo had a, a normal development phase. Right. In terms of length of time. Now, uh, kind of precipitously, the, the, the process was ended more precipitously yeah. than normal because of the Austro-Prussian War. Hmm. But it had been ongoing before that as a normal... Right. We want a next generation firearm. Right. But I thought one of the interesting um, ideas they took was we will develop the best percussion rifle we can, and whatever's new has to be better than that. Which was the 1856 um, carbine, the Commission de Vincennes, which was the same caliber, so 11 millimeter. It fired the same bullet as the initial Traspo, sort of wasted, sort of heavy, nose heavy bullet. But it was a normal percussion uh, carbine, and yeah, basically same sights as well. The rear sight mm. was the same, and yeah, if you can't get better accuracy than this, then find, why find, find, find something else. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which was, but once again, we see, like, when it came to war with Prussia, the French had by far the better rifle. Mm. And yet, at the same time, it was a rifle that was, in some ways, obsolete the moment it was adopted. You know, yeah. The American Civil War had shown that metallic cartridges were all sorts of capable, and yep. clearly the way that the future was going yeah. to be. And they knew that. Yeah. <laughs> and there were plenty of observers from Europe who had right. seen it in action, yeah. And yet, once again, was, <laughs> we're going to adopt the best rifle that's out there, but by the way, it's also already obsolete. Yeah. It's, it'll it'll do for the next conflict, <laughs> but dang, we lost. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah and those metallic cartridges are a good thing. Why don't we just convert it and call it a gras? They oh, did nice. have a design that was very easily converted yeah. to. Yeah. You know, there was a significant trial period. Yeah. To produce to develop the gras to pick the gras. Um, I mean, it's it's significantly better, more modern in inverted commas rifle than the Dreiser. Yeah, needle yeah. fire, largely by virtue of being a significant time later. This mm. is true. Yeah. Um, but if you look at the other, there was another needle. There's one other major needle fire, and that was the Carcano needle fire. And that thing is a gigantic <laughs> dumpster fire. <laughs> um, and it's 1867. Yeah. So it's the exact same time as the Shasta. But, but that was a bit crippled with by Carcano's financial limitations. True. And it was designed to be a conversion of <laughs> muzzle loaders, not its yeah. own new rifle. Because he, he had a single shot metallic design ready. But it's just, yeah, well, we've got no money, so right. <laughs> back, and, back to the drawing board you go. <laughs> and we've got a ton of these, what were they, like 17, 18 millimeter yeah, muzzle loaders the, the to usual, make use of. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there was another one. There was the Russian needle fire, which I've had in my hands once. Hmm. Literally. I've, I spotted it in Iraq, but we were on the way out from the Dutch Army Museum, so it was just, oh, there's one. <laughs> um, that was interesting, because it seemed, that one seems to be self-cocking, as in oh. part of the bolt action cocks it. Okay. Um, but apparently the cartridge was terrible. Hmm. Um, and again, it was the dry type breech seal. Now, interesting, interesting tangents. The 
neither the dry sip nor the chassepot are self-cocking. You yeah. have to thumb back the cocking piece. And there's an important reason for yeah. that. Yeah. Um, there was concern over uh, if you have a, a primer that doesn't detonate when that needle goes into the cartridge, if it's self-cocking, there is the possibility that the cartridge will detonate on friction from retracting the needle. Yep. Yeah. And so for safety reasons, you would retract the needle manually while the bolt remained locked, then open the bolt if it still hasn't detonated. Yeah, because the, 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 the needle goes through the primer. Right. Yeah. Um, and primers, we are, in the 21st century, primers are luxuriously um, <laughs> stable. efficient, yeah. stable, reliable things. They weren't, right. even during the two world wars, they weren't. So there were like special grades of ammunition for shooting through propeller arcs and things, and not to be used in <laughs> synchronized machine guns after this date, because even as late as World War II, primer reliability was an issue. And also another tangent is why they hung on to um, uh, corrosive priming compounds mm. so long, even though they're corrosive and horrible, uh, because it stored better and was more right. reliable yeah. for, a, for a long time. I think if you want to get a good sense for the, the state of primer technology, think about the state of brass cartridge case technology with those balloon head Martini Henry cartridges. Yeah. Look at the brass on that, <laughs> which basically looks like yellow tin foil. Yeah. Compared to a modern cartridge case. You mean the roll the rolled yeah. ones? Yeah, yeah. the rolled ones. They're literally they're just it's brass foil yeah. rolled around a former by yeah. hand. And imagine that there's a similar disparity in, in primers then and now. Mm. Yeah. Um so back at the French plot. So um after the after the Labelle, we ended with the the Bertier, and already in the eighteen nineties the French are looking at self-loaders, mm -hmm. as are the Brits, mm -hmm. yeah. but the French probably more seriously than the Brits. So <laughs> close for the first time, <laughs> and not the last time, <laughs> that close to getting it done in time. Yeah, yeah. And they did not. They sort of did. There were a thousand Meuniers. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Meunier. That one. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, because it doesn't end with an E, so. <laughs> yeah. Everything at the end is just sad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, contrary to popular belief, and sort of do a bit of British stuff in here. The Europeans were looking at self-loading rifles very, very early. Yeah. And there's a whole series in the 1904 British textbook of small arms about them. But again, it, com it comes down to the cartridge manufacturing technology, there's the, 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 the general alloy technology of the era. I mean, all the machine guns of the era are massive. Right. You can do a lot more with a Maxim type lock with, with 19th century steels than mm -hmm. you can anything that's meant to be shoulder yeah. portable yeah. Um, and the French were looking very very seriously M meanwhile they're making these horrible <laughs> three-shot Bertiers <laughs> yeah. um, and developing a series of rifles that again they are behind the curve yes I have sadly I yeah. have to, yeah. Yeah. They, yes, are they are very much behind the curve now let's be clear the infantry had an eight-shot repeater yeah the cavalry had three yeah, but, but by, by World War One, you got a lot of French infantry carrying three-shot Bertier long rifles. But only only by 1915. Okay. Yeah. Um, that is a wartime emergency development of the Bertier mm -hmm. system that mm -hmm. was never intended to be an infantry rifle. Because mm. the French were working on semi-autos. Right, exactly. So right, that's going to be the thing that replaces the Labelle, <laughs> yeah. is a self-loader. And it's also the point that we, we, we stressed more than once is that we overestimate the amount of actual firing that they are doing yeah so you say it's only an eight shot magazine yeah but okay um if you're repelling a, a trench advance sure you get to eight and then <laughs> and then it's and then you get then you got stuff yeah. but of course there's a hell of a lot of you i think there's an interesting thing to look at in that they spend so much time and develop they have three parallel tracks of self-loading rifle development all going on for 15 years, yeah, close to 15 years. And then what actually gets adopted and put into service, and is, by the way, really the only self-loading combat rifle in service in World War I, is the RSC that's basically just whipped up by <laughs> Louis Chosha when he's done with the machine gun. Like, oh, can you also do a rifle? Sure. Boom, here, yeah. <laughs> a year later, it's ready. After 15 years of totally unrelated developments. Mm. Um, uh, were the Merniers actually fielded in field trials during the war? Or I is this believe a one of they were. Maybe yeah. Yeah. As far as I can tell, they actually were. Uh, um, they were. The, yeah, the, it was 
very small number and the, the issue was logistics. Mm. <laughs> they built a thousand of them in 1916 yeah. and they would have not have devoted the resources to building them in 1916 if they were not actually going to see, tri see mm. field use, which they did, which is part of the reason why there are so few of them around today. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I think they just used them until they ran out of available ammunition mm. and then yeah. scrapped them. So you get, this, you get the situation where in late World War, late World War One, you've got the French being the only army in in combat that actually has a serious issue of self-loading rifles, mm -hmm. which are alongside three shot and then later five shot <laughs> Berthiers, which are behind the curve, and Labelle tube loaders, which are very much behind the curve, and yeah. they're all in there together, also with a light machine gun slash machine rifle that. That is once again simultaneously the best <laughs> and the worst. <laughs> yes. In concept, it is the leader in its class. But the only, yeah, the only one. So, um, you know, people talk about the BAR. The BAR showed up like six weeks before the end of the war. Um, there were more shoshas made than any other automatic weapon of World War One. A, qu a quarter of a million. Yeah. Mm. Those lines. And, and yet, and I still don't have one. <laughs> ha ha! You have all the other French machine guns that I want. Damn it. <laughs> Someday we should combine our collections, and no one will ever be better than us. Yeah, that would be good. <laughs> um, so let's talk about machine guns for a minute. Now, they liked the Hotchkiss, but they didn't want to pay Hotchkiss royalties for it. <laughs> Bien sûr. So then we end up with the Saint-Étienne. The backwards Hotchkiss. Yeah. The backwards Hotchkiss, with all the stuff to make it run backwards. That I have no doubt cost more to make than a Hotchkiss plus the royalties. Plus royalty, uh, yeah. But you're not pricing the pride. Fact. That's very that expensive. has a very has large no monetary <laughs> value in this in this period of firearms nationalism. Yes. How um, can we put more gears? In there? We need more gears. <laughs> yeah. I would like a rack and pinion in my machine gun. Please. Ian has a has a video on this from a while back, and yeah. it's just this amazing so build a better mousetrap, yeah. fantastic bit of pointless engineering. Someday I will find one and I will buy it. Yeah. I must have. You must have it. A Saint yeah. Etienne. Yeah. I yeah. will. It'll happen. <laughs> and before that, they have one that's even bon more bonkers, which is the 1905 uh, Puteaux, which, like, think Saint-Étienne, but then we're also going to stick some springs on the outside. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. With um, no cowling. Or... Right. Yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> why, why do you need that? <laughs> uh, I would love to have one of those, too, yeah. to the best of my knowledge. I have not yet found evidence of any existing in the United States, and there are Precious scarce in France. Elsewhere, yeah. You know, you can find one somewhere else and gas axe it and ship it into the, oh, but, <laughs> and then have it as a dealer sample. Yeah. <laughs> Parts kit puto. Yeah. Yeah. Semi auto kit with an AR fifteen trigger group. <laughs> We're being mean. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I think th there's nothing wrong with the Hotchkiss. Like the Hotchkiss no. was a, a fabulous heavy machine gun. It, um, it it does what it does. It it's its own concept, and we are used to the. Um, to the Maxim type concept, and then okay, you, then you got the, the 1917 Browning, which conforms to that at a, at a glance, unless you really know what you're looking for. Mm. If you don't know the difference between a single pistol grip and a, and a spade grip, you go, what's a Maxim? Because yeah. it, it's very much in the same vein, whereas the Hotchkiss goes in, in a different direction that will have a big heavy barrel and a big bronze radiator yeah. and strips. Um, and also the portative version of it was adopted by the US, Hatch's favorite of the light machine guns. Um, and the Brits. Hold on, I need to... <laughs> Sorry, the Hotchkiss portative being anyone's favorite anything. Yes, well, it was, it was, ha it was Hatch's. Um, everyone seemed to like the Lewis, but, ha but Hatcher was convinced that the Hotchkiss portative was the... Uh, mm -hmm. Or Benny Mercier. Right. Or how do you say that in American? Bennett Mercy. Benet Mercier. No. Oh, we usually call it the Benet Mercier. Or the Benet Mercier. Was it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Frankly, nobody in the US even knows about them, so we don't discuss yeah. them very much. <laughs> yeah. I get confused. Like, I, I want to say the common pronunciation in the US is not the correct French pronunciation of the name. Mm. But mm. Um, The British cavalry had it as their, as their light machine gun, as the, as the Hotchkiss Portative. Um, and that lasted through the interwar period as well. It was common in British tanks as mm. a as a port machine gun. Um, they were actually a very, very successful design. Yes, they were. Yeah, I still see it. Uh, I've been reading up for, on the Navic exposition. All the uh, substantial number of pictures they've got 
they took, they took them with them. And these guys oh, are taking them apart and hauling them up mountains. Wow. And you found a picture of one in the mountains in Norway with yeah. a cow catcher. Yeah, with a cow catcher <laughs> in the front. Because I was thinking, surely that's not a Saint-Étienne. They can't have done that. <laughs> 1940, a Saint-Étienne. <laughs> yeah. And an expeditionary mission. Because you can't really see the, the cooling shroud on it. So mm. You just see the big cow catcher on the front. No, 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 no. no. no but it's actually so, a Hotchkiss with a cow catcher. It's interesting to point out, the Hotchkiss was good enough, and French interwar development was bad enough, that my 1914 Hotchkiss was manufactured in 1939. Yeah. They were still making them still right making up to them. World War One, World War Two. So that makes sense. Um, yeah. And I would like to point out, in defense, further defense of the Hotchkiss Heavy, for everyone who's gone to a machine gun shoot, and you look at the maxims, because a good proper machine gun shoot is always going to have some maxims. <laughs> look at the maxims and see how many of them are dripping water, and firing inconsistently, and mm -hmm. people are over there cranking on fusy springs, and cranking on belt tension, and trying to get the things to actually run right. Yeah compared to the Hotchkiss guns, which are much rarer to see. But on those, typically, you insert strip, pull trigger, insert strip, pull trigger. And either works And they or just doesn't. run. <laughs> yeah. but they, and it's not even that they don't work. Yeah. They just do work. Mm. And there's nothing that needs to be fiddled with. They don't have a water jacket that inevitably drips. Mm -hmm. Like, you look at the experience on the line today, and I think that shows a lot of the value of the Hotchkiss design. Mm. But, yeah. On the, on the other hand, you'd have been in a much better parts and spares environment back in the day. And I suspect that a lot of people are not using the correct asbestos string True. seals. <laughs> um, interestingly, some of our Swiss collector friends who have MG11 Swiss Maxims um, have managed to source some of the correct asbestos string. Yeah. But the judge of a gun, I think, is how well it can be used when it's not being used appropriately. Mm. Like, that's the whole reason people appreciate the AK. Yeah. Mm. Is sure, you know, the AR runs great with good maintenance and it'll run for a long time with no maintenance. But at some point you there, you know, the AR can be a bit of a helicopter. If you've got things mm -hmm. that aren't quite right, you know, your buffer isn't quite right or it can stop working Doesn't in a way that the AK mm -hmm. is has a wider range of operating conditions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the Hotchkiss is like that. The Maxim is great as long as you know how to run it and you do at least a handful of critical operations correctly. The Hotchkiss just kind of doesn't care. You can mm. neglect it and it'll keep working better than a Maxim. Mm. So I think this segues into the interwar period. I think we've dealt with World War I enough now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so rifle development immediately post World War I. I mean, everyone's tied out. Not <laughs> well, we discover in 19, what is it, 21, when they started the commission, that in yeah. fact, every single small arm in the French military inventory is crap. Finally. Like, and they all have to go. <laughs> yep. The cartridge has to go. Uh, in fact, all of the cartridges have to go. We're going to get rid of 32. We're going to get rid of the 8mm revolver. We're going to get rid of 8mm Lebel. They're all crap. Yep. Let's build everything brand new. We have this great plan to do it. Fast forward 20 years, <laughs> and they have a machine gun and just barely a bolt action rifle. Yeah, which is <laughs> amazing. But we need yeah. to get there. We need to get there first. So we've got okay. forward, forward thinking again of yeah. okay, we've identified the issue. <laughs> and it's then, easy. Which Everything. is easy. And then we're going to adopt an excellent yeah. light machine gun. So we're going to start with the cartridge. Yeah. yeah. And then build the light machine gun around that cartridge. Yes. But the cartridge had a problem. Yes. Yeah. So the original 7.5 French was 7.5 by 58. And the French had a lot of MG08s and 0815s in their inventory as reparations from Germany. And they're using them as training guns. Why burn out our, our good modern guns mm -hmm. when we've got this crap from Germany that we don't, we're not going to standardize on it anyway? Train the troops on it. It turns out that you can take an 8mm Mauser mm -hmm. and chamber it in 7.5 by 58 and fire it. Kaboom. And yeah. it does bad things to the gun. Uh, interesting little tangent, a little Americana tangent, is uh, Hatcher again was involved in a lot of the um, investigations of Springfield kabooms, and it seems that a fairly common source of Springfield kabooms was captured 8mm Mauser getting into the, <laughs> the system, yeah. and it's a controlled feed. It's, it's 3006 is 7.62 by 63. 8mm mm -hmm. Mauser is well, 7.9 or 92, depending on who you ask, <laughs> by 57, similar taper. If it goes in on a charger or into the into the magazine, it will 
it will be supported by the um, by the extractor, and it can fire. And there, are at hmm. least, if I, I remember rightly, there there's at least one of the kabooms, if not several, that could be traced to eight mil Mauser getting into a place it really shouldn't hmm. have gone. So it's not just the. Uh, it's a conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> so the French solution to this was to shorten the case four millimeters, yep. so that you could still stuff an eight millimeter round yep. in, but the bolt would not be able to close or lock, and thus the mechanical safeties would prevent the gun from firing. Yep. And thereby accidentally created probably one of the best cartridges of its era. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, it created the best. I would say arguably one of the best cartridges of the 1950s. Probably. And they did it in the 1920s. 130 how many grains? 139. 39, yeah. At muzzle velocity? Was it 2450, 2550? <clears throat> it's very similar to 7.62 NATO. Yeah, and operating just a little bit lighter. Just a little bit lighter. And yeah. operating at substantially less pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for almost the exact same ballistics. Yeah, that's a, it, those are excellent ballistics. Yeah. Um, so they, they do this, and then they immediately, and like efficiently and effectively design a light machine gun that is, I'm going to go out on a limb and say the best machine gun, best light machine gun of its time. And in this case, it's not the worst at the same time. It's <laughs> yeah, legitimately time, yeah. just a really good light machine gun. If you don't mind tiny iris. True. Like, you, you, <laughs> okay, um, this, this is another, this that's, is another thing that's we'll, that's we'll, another thing, we'll yeah. touch on. That uh, If you think US aperture sights are small, <laughs> you need to try a French aperture sight. <laughs> yeah. um, um, but mechanically. The thing is, people look at them as a World War II machine gun yeah, and say, not. ah, well, the brand is better. And mm. yes, yeah. the brand is better. The Chateau is a 1924 design. Yeah. That predates the Swiss Fur LMG25, it predates the Degturevs, it predates the entire ZB series that led to the Bren. Really, when that gun was developed, it was, and correct me if I'm missing anything here, but it would be Bren, Shosha, and Chatelereau. Those are your light machine guns that are out there. And Lewis, and Lewis. Uh, but is the Lewis is clearly an obsolete gun by the end of World War I. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's basically, um, and I'm probably going to get angry comments for this. It's the best BAR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The French do one of their classic <laughs> military trials, and this is why, by the way, there are a number of military trials in French service where, like, zero commercial companies show up because they know yeah, it's they, they be, don't. They be, yeah. th they've they've played this. <laughs> this is not <laughs> their game first before. game of knifey spoony. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what the French trials do is they say, "Give us all of your best guns, and we will look at them all and steal all your ideas." And we will then take the best ideas <laughs> from all of yours and put them into ours and build it in our factory and pay you nothing. And yeah. so, yes, in fact, the Chatelero is de facto a Bren. Which is B A R. Yeah, sorry. You said you said um, Bren earlier when you meant yeah, B A R. B -A -R. I, sorry, yeah, correction. Yeah, I did. Which, which which was surprised me when I did the um, Mat Forty Nine vid that here rarely some com there was a legitimate commercial input trial input. And they, they did just say well, maybe this time we'll, <laughs> we'll get some fame and glory and money, but no. Nope. <laughs> uh. yeah. No. Fool. <laughs> Fool me once more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So at this point, the French have these plans of we're going to have a new pistol, we're going to have a new light machine gun, we're going to have a new light mortar, we're going to have a submachine gun, because, wow, the Germans had that submachine gun thing, and that was pretty slick. Like, yeah. let's get us some of them. Um, it's also re reorganizing the, the squad around the light machine gun. Lessons learned and all that. Yeah. So. There's a little 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 tangent. Late yeah. World War One, certainly in the the British experience, was everything was done on a platoon level, and you'd have a Lewis section, and you'd have a rifle grenade mm -hmm. section, and a, mm -hmm. a rifleman slash bomber section, um, and the 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 better interwar light machine guns enable a section as the smallest so, unit of manoeuvre yeah. with a gun group and a rifle group. And it, it, it brings it brings the light machine gun down from several of them at platoon level and concentrated to one per section, and it's yeah. much more organic. But it was the technology that permitted that, because you're going to have a hell of a time running a Lewis with a gun group and a rifle group with being eight men in total. I mean, it's not that you can't, but <laughs> with the ammo carriage and the fact that the gun's a boat anchor and... Yeah and all of that. So the French are massively ahead of the curve with the FM24 and FM24 slash 29, which is just the, the rechambering for yep. non splody time. <laughs> and you have one. Yep. And you have one. I have one. Yes, yeah. I do. Yeah. 
Uh, FM, by the way, for those of you who aren't into the French guns, is fusil mitrailleur, or a machine rifle. Yep. Yeah. So that when you see them refre reference like the FM twenty four twenty nine, it's the light machine gun. And they have a quickish change barrel. Yeah. It needs a spanner. You're yeah. Not, you're I mean, it's, it's it's not intended for field repl real, field replacement. Yeah. It I mean, takes minimal tools, but you're not going to do it. Not like not like <laughs> you would with a Bren or an MG thirty four yeah. or an MG forty two. But better uh, than a BAR. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You're not having to take it to an armorer. Right. <laughs> and I think that was just. <clears throat> One step prior to this further step of quick change barrel. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone Just introducing that. quick change yeah. barrels. Yeah. yeah. And and this firearm is genuinely good for its era, and it doesn't get replaced until the French adopt a general purpose machine gun in yeah. the in the fifties. Fifties, sixties. Yeah. And we're talking about this is the army, the gendarmerie. <laughs> right. Keep it until the eighties. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ne never used it, but. It was an inventory. Yeah. yeah, these things hang around. This is another another thing with uh, with the French in general is that they're not afraid to keep stuff hanging around. So labels are still hanging around, not in front line use, but they're hanging around in uh, in 1940 still and in yeah. colonial use. Absolutely, into... I have a 1937 refurb. There's a lot of those. <laughs> yeah. I see a lot of 1936 date rebuilds, yeah. mm. rebarreled labels. I think the 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 actual. Um, edict to stop only comes out in 1939. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> to stop refurbishing. Yeah. <laughs> and then a lot of the frontline infantry in World War II, in, in, in the uh, Westfeldzug, as the Germans know it, the, mm. uh, the Battle of France, a lot of them are still armed with five shot Berthiers with sticky out bolt handles, long yeah. rifles. Yeah. Yeah, the standard, standard armament. Yeah. Um, so they are still hanging around because they had gazillions of them. Right. Yeah. Um, and they had been planning on adopting a self-loading <laughs> rifle. Right. Yes. In fact, they were going to do a self-loader and a new bolt action parallel to each yeah. other. With the yeah. bolt action as the Remf boomstick and the yeah. self-loader mm -hmm. as the... Uh, Operator's gear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the leet tier. Hmm. Yeah, but... And even... Um, of course they, were, they were basing it on the internal magazine. Mm -hmm. However... Just before war were declared, they were had ordered uh, to switch production to a box-fed magazine, ten-round box-fed. Box-fed obviously didn't happen, so they would have had detachable box mag, semi-auto rifle. If war had been declared just a little bit later. Well, I mean, a couple of years <laughs> with the with the production. It's probably two years later it would be. Yeah. If, if yeah. I recall correctly, it was they had produced something like fifty Moss forties. Yeah. For the first round of field trials and those, when the armistice. Yeah. And those those have a five round ma internal Mauser right. style box magazine fed yeah. with stripper clips. So yeah. on the one hand it's a self loading rifle, on the other hand <laughs> it's eighteen eighty nine te feeding technology. As a, yeah, ammo ammo uh, philosophy. Shades <laughs> of the label again. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Good tech, yeah. bad loading system. Yeah. Um, yeah, and this explains why they have that incredibly goofy side latch magazine on the, all of the later Moss semi-autos. Yeah. It's because with the end of the war, we want to get these things into production as quickly as possible. Um, mm. they're, I don't think they actually succeed, but the goal was to have them in production before the war was actually over. Mm -hmm. They started back in on this project as soon as the, the Saint-Étienne arsenal was liberated in 1944. Yeah. Uh, and they would, in fact, start producing... Uh, Moss 36s again while the war was still going. Yeah. I don't believe the Moss 44s came out until just after. No, the war they came. Out, they came out after. What date? What date is yours? Um, I I don't know. It's a, it's a mid series. So I don't think it will be now. Yeah, straight. It's a little mm -hmm. tricky to find because the yeah. Moss 44s were all Navy rifles, yeah. and so they don't have the roundel stamp with a month and year of acceptance. Okay. So oh, yeah. interesting that the. the you say the they have this goofy external mag catch, but the the initial design was an internal mag catch. I believe it. Yeah, it was. It would curve. It was a spring clip that would curve on both sides inside the receiver. Uh, obviously, uh, <laughs> it wasn't a satisfactory design, but that was the initial. Um, yeah, there's not much meat in there to. Yeah. For it to grip onto anything. So. So then we got the Mass Thirty Six, which is up towards the god tier of the of the bolt action service rifles which was intended as a conscript boom uh, as a remf <laughs> conscript boom stick yeah. uh, using as many parts in common as possible and the similar design philosophy to 
what became the Mass 40. And it's this long sequence of development throughout the 1930s in, in parallel. Yeah, so and many it's so designs. French, so many minor <laughs> variations, and technically each one has its own designation and it all works its way. With each what? bit having its own There's, committee to decide. <laughs> there are not quite dozens, but close. There are over a dozen different French governments in, what was it, between like, I'm going to get this wrong because I didn't take specific notes on it, but between like 35 and 39, they go through almost a dozen governments. All right, just stand it. It, it. This is part of the reason why nothing can get done, is there's yeah. argument the much of the government doesn't trust the military. The military is more conservative. The governments are often more socialist. They don't trust each other. They think if we give the military money, they're gonna just arm up and have a coup and take the government back from us. <laughs> yeah. So we'll withhold military funding. And the one of the results of that is all of these arms development projects that are planned in the 1920s really don't come to fruition until like 1937. When people finally go, oh crap, like, Let's, what submachine gun, what's the, the current state of the sub, whatever it is, we'll yeah. adopt it as it is. How's the rifle? Good enough, we'll take it, start building them. Yeah. The neighbor's being awkward again. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so we end up with, a, with the Mass 36, which was never intended to be a frontline infantry rifle, and it ends up being what? the... <laughs> Where have we heard as this far story? As possible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and then you end up with simultaneously a touching on God tier bolt action rifle alongside five shot Berthiers with sticky out bolt handles. Yep. And I think before people dispute your judgment of how good the Moss 36 is, I think part of recognizing its quality requires an understanding of industrial production. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the genius of the Moss 36 is how it can actually be manufactured. It is the best production engineered military bolt action firearm ever. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. It's just beautifully conceived and the bits of it that are agricultural don't actually affect its performance which is amazing because it looks agricultural in the hands it actually balances quite well it's short nice and good compact. aperture sights yeah. um, aside from the fact it's a tiny pinprick <laughs> yeah the stock's a little short for me yeah um i throw a stock spacer on there and i'm good to go the, mm. Do you know why they cranked the bolt handle forward? Because it, it basically, if it hadn't been cranked forward, it would fall in a basically an optimal position. And there's one on the front of Jean Huon's book yeah. where they, for some it's reason, sort of curve, it's right? straight. Yeah. It, 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 it's got a slight curve in it. It's straight down. Um, why did they crank it forward? Was it to bring it into a similar position to where the Berthier turned down handle is? Their understanding was that it was cranked forward to put it in the optimal position. Oh, but they were wrong. Well, you're British and they're <laughs> French, and so thus clearly they we're going to have some arguments. They have here. different hands. They, they have hands that go like that and not that. They have different cheeks, too, if you've ever tried to use the sights on a Hotchkiss Universal, a Shosha, a Moss 38, all of those guns. I think the Shosha is built around alien anatomy it, because I don't think anybody. Yeah. Can I, I can't <laughs> hardly crank my face down. Into that thing. Yeah. But. They have, I digress. They have strange ergonomic ideas yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Map 49, absolutely brilliant, except who puts a tiny little pinprick aperture on a submachine gun? Um, the French. It's tradition. And okay, the, 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 range, the, tradition. the range where we, where we go to permitted shoots, it's not extremely well lit. You <laughs> literally, it's just like, nah, forget it, let's go 80s action movie <laughs> and walk them in because literally you look through this thing and unless it's like the blazing sunshine of Algeria, you're not seeing anything through this well, It often, it often the time was the yeah. blazing sunshine yeah. of Algeria. Yeah. Well, it was also the era of uh, yeah. shooting it. There was a lot of... Hip, hip shooting wasn't just a movie trope. Yeah, yeah. this is true. Um, Very true. In certain eras, it was... Keep heads down. The, it was yeah. the way it was done for various reasons. Um, uh, a lot of the uh, World War II British revolver training was not using sights, it was, in, it was instinctive. <laughs> um, and that lasted in, um, in US service, particularly the FBI, into the 60s even. Yeah. So before you go, her back was Brits. This lasted longer <laughs> in, US, in US police than it did in British, uh, British military service. Mm. But there was just the, the, the thinking of the time. Mm. Um, the Moss 40, again, a brilliant mechanical system. Yep. Extremely mm -hmm. simple, uh, true um, gas impingement. 
Yeah. AR-15 is a bit of a different <laughs> hybrid piston yeah. system. Um, There's a drill a blind hole in the bolt face. Blow gas into blow it. Blow gas into it. Yeah. Done. <laughs> I mean, you do have you do have a standing uh, a, a standing piston in there with with um, swirl grooves and and everything, isn't it? Because yeah. the, the Mass Forty Nine Fifty Six has 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 one has some sort of pis, um, piston esque standing piston esque thing on the top of the receiver that the that goes into the yeah, blind. I mean, hole. it's got the, it's the end the end the of the end. gas tube. Yeah. That's all. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's it. I don't have one, sorry. <laughs> um, I <laughs> don't have one. No. I need one. He doesn't need one, you can just... Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, interwar and World War II pistols, this is mm. very much your thing, not not mine. Where do we end up with pistols? Well, how far are we going back? Well, the ruby <laughs> sucks, so we have to get rid of the ruby I, in 1921. Yeah, I, and the ruby, by the way, doesn't I, totally suck. No, the ruby I is crude, like it. but effective. I have, I, have, I, have something for, I have a soft spot for rubies. How many rubies do you have now? I have ten. Wow, <laughs> that's even more than I have. <laughs> Running from the absolute horriblest quality and possibly used as a uh, poacher's gun because <laughs> it looks like it's been fitted with a shoulder stock to mm. something which uh, the only thing letting it down is it's, not, it's missing the glossy black. I have fluid. two of the long barreled patterns that were trialed, they were presented as an option yeah. for the French to replace the ruby with. Mm. We'll make it a longer barrel. And they have much better sights too. Yeah. They have nice big square front post sights. Yeah, the sights are universally suck. That's On true. these, they do not. Yeah. These actually have good sights. Mm. Uh, but that was not to be. Yeah, then there was, um, so if we, if we go from the ruby onwards, um, they find this handy person called uh, Petter, who um, comes up with a design which now more famously associated with the SIG um, 210 or Pistola 49. Um, and the French have basically a prequel to that, slim down, uh, but they don't decide on 9mm because at the time 9mm isn't necessarily it's best common, but it's not yeah. as it's not universal. obviously and universal as it is today. Um, and it's still considered a, a self-defense pistol. It's not your offensive firearm. And this is a period where handgun effectiveness is often determined is often calculated by penetration. Yeah. How many pine boards can the bullet go through? And so having a smaller diameter bullet allows you to get the same penetration with a lighter weight bullet less recoil, smaller pistol, simpler pistol. And by the measuring standard, kind of the universal measuring standard of the day, it's just as effective because it has just as much penetration. Yeah, so that's, that's 7.65 long we're talking about. 30 Peterson. <laughs> we, haven't, <coughs> we haven't actually mentioned yes, what it is. Which yes. is directly derived from 30 Peterson. Yeah. And um, yeah, so they decide to standardize on that and this, this PETA design Works fine. It's a great little pistol. Yeah. It's, it basically, it's like a mini SIG 210. Yeah. With, with, with far looser tolerancing. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And they adopt it in 1935, and it's made by SACM, mm -hmm. the Société Alsacienne de Construction Mécanique. And Société Alsacienne de Construction Mécanique. That one, yes. <laughs> uh, and it's the, the 35A for Alsacienne. And then they fairly quickly realize that we're going to need more pistols than this they little company down yep. south can actually make. So we'll take the number two contestant from Moss, and we'll just adopt that one too. Yeah. Good enough. They were not related. There are some people, I think, who say that the 35S is like a simplified 35A, and that's it's completely not, not yeah. true. They're developed independently. They both compete at the trials, and the A is adopted first, and then they just they need more guns. So yeah. we'll take the S as well because they're both good. I mean, the, a, the, the S has a rebounding trigger, which the A doesn't, for <laughs> example. Um, uh, they both have self-contained removable fire control yeah. groups, which so was a different. stipulation. Yeah. One um, of them's like this size, and the other one, <laughs> the size of the, the entire yeah, content the entire of the back strap. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, frankly, the A is a much nicer pistol than the S. I have a sample size of one of each, so I actually, ergonomically, actually prefer the S. Oh, you're wrong. Because, <laughs> because on mine, my two, it has a much better trigger. Okay. That's, that's an understandable reason. Yeah. And this, I find the sights, the, the big, nice, clear U-notch mm. on the S nicer. 
unfortunately, mechanically, it does. <laughs> I'm having more issues shooting it than the A. So, in terms of usability, the A wins. <laughs> They're both Browning type <laughs> tilting barrel, yeah. locked breech pistols. And yet, into World War II and beyond, they are still fielding Model <laughs> 92 revolvers, yep. the substitute standard uh, Model 92 Spanish, as they call them, which are the I bar. Smith and Wesson knockoff, also thingies. in also <laughs> in uh, eight millimeter French ordnance, uh, yeah. feature of a very very early low quality bloke on the range video and dumb skit. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Inferior Spanish singies was your phrase. Um, are the rubies still being fielded? Yes, very much. Um, we have our friend um, Matthew Williamson. Uh -huh. He has he showed us a link to uh, the. Unknown to me, French intervention in Zeeland, in Holland, mm. where they actually that they uh, decided not to obey the armistice hmm. and fought on as far as they you know, in, inevitably they were going to be crushed. Uh, but they they ignored the armistice and they had French support. Um, and the, one of the left one of the uh, relics from that is a ruby. <laughs> with with uh, with mags, spare mags, holster, and they found who it belonged to, some infantry officer. So obviously that was his legitimate sidearm for 1939, 40, I can't remember. Anyway, hmm. still his service, service sidearm. So even the emergency substitute standards made out of old railway lines in Ibar <laughs> yeah. were still in service in late World War II. <laughs> Because they're just for self-defense, so the it still works. Yeah, badges of badges of rank. Um, yeah. of offensive handgun use was a thing that came in World War One due to the unique circumstances of trench, of, of, of trench yeah. warfare. Died out again, and sort of it's almost the only example of serious offensive handgun use in major combat. Yeah, as yeah. a general, as a general thing, and not just as something that special types. Yeah. Do yeah. resulting in those huge HK, <laughs> yeah. which, by the way, things. as far as I am informed, people hate. I'm not surprised. <laughs> I, I could just about carry a carbine for the weight of that thing and its ammunition. So yeah. why yeah. bother? Yeah. Um, so yeah, they were basically weapons of self-defense, um, badges of rank, and pour encourager les autres, <laughs> and equip machine gunners because they couldn't right. carry rifles. Yeah. 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 Um, so. Submachine guns running into World War II. So you have one of the... I do. I have a Moss 38, mm. um, which is a tremendously cute little submachine gun. Um, <laughs> very handy, very small. Shoots the same 7.65 long cartridge, 30-round uh, magazines. It's a really good gun. It's got a bit of a bad reputation these days because until just recently you couldn't get ammunition for it. Mm. And so people couldn't shoot it. Um, it's controllable. It's incredibly small and handy. Um, yeah, I think, if I remember correctly, it's not, relatively speaking, not that many made. Yeah, by the time war were declared, roughly how many know. were in circulation? I honestly don't know. I'd have to look it up. Okay. Yeah. Um, I didn't cover it in my book. Ah. It is not a rifle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but also, at the same time, once, well, around the time war were declared, both the French and the Brits ordered as many commercial Thompsons yeah, yeah. from the States as humanly possible at eye-watering prices. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the British were paying gold bullion for them. Uh, 45 to 50 pounds a unit. Um, and off the top of my head, a Bren was something like 26. Mm. And I think, <laughs> um, in uh, a figure that I do have right, in, uh, in a World War II RAF price list, you've got uh, P14 rifles at seven pounds, and SMLE is a little bit below seven pounds. Just to put in perspective how much they were asking yeah. for these, and not paper. It had to be paid in proper, proper money, real money. Yeah. Put your ingots down. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> cash and carry. <laughs> and um, there were very few. You see, very, very few, if any, in photos of the 1940 Battle of France. But there were some. Mm. But not a universal issue because later, later in the world, Brits are issuing one, one submachine gun or machine carbine, technically machine carbines, <laughs> uh, per infantry section. But not at that time. You would um, your frontline infantry section of eight men plus or minus 
is going to have a brain gun and everyone else ha carrying a rifle. Um, and some of the ones that were in transit to the French when, Fran when France fell ended up mm. diverted to the UK. Basically, all the war material that was mid-Atlantic during um, uh, at the point of the fall of France got diverted to the UK. A few degrees north. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is, is interestingly, it's, it's why the UK never had any um, aviation petrol issues during the Battle of Britain because hmm. all the tankers of 100 octane intended for the French <laughs> Air Force <laughs> diverted a few degrees north. Interesting, yeah. I didn't know that. Uh, we had no fuel we had no fuel issues because everything that we'd ordered came that Plus. wasn't sunk um, <laughs> and everything that the French had ordered and hadn't arrived that came too. Hmm. So uh, we were we were we were petrol rich. Yeah. Speaking of submachine guns, the French also had a couple thousand Irma EMPs. Yeah. Yes, which turned up in film the Papillon the film Papillon, mm. mm -hmm. they've um, e EMPs, and this is set in the 50s. Um, and I was thinking that's got to be ahistoric, and then I discovered that no. Yeah, they come from coming over from Spain. Right, they were very popular in the Spanish Civil War, and uh, Spanish Republican refugees at the end of the war coming over the Alps turned in their EMPs to the French. Uh, not a lot of magazines with them, but they got the guns, yeah. and the French used them briefly until they were <laughs> recaptured by the Germans and used by the SS. <laughs> It's coming home, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, th and, and this brings us to a general point, and it applies in World War One, World War Two, not so well to a certain degree, but not so much because it was over too quickly. And then later is that the, the French military was never afraid of, of purchasing stuff under urgent operational requirements, as they're known mm. in British well, parlance today. Not since the 1870s, no. <laughs> no, it provided excellent fodder for Othias of of C and Arsenal because his cut off at the moment is still aside from when he's done some neutrals, was, was it used in the war? Can you place it in theatre? Which is how he found some photos of Crag. <laughs> so take the entire Remington commercial catalogue and it appeared in theatre with the French. You say probably. Yeah, yeah. In, and pretty much the entire Winchester commercial catalogue, self-loaders yeah. and lever rifles mm -hmm. and yep. Berthier's ordered by, uh, from Remington. And basically, if it went bang, the French would buy, buy it, it yeah. in World yeah. War One. And there was, there was also the issue of just the stuff that was in stock for commercial sale at Manufrance when the war started. Mm. A large amount of that got purchased up by the French government when they realized they were going to need guns. And I think that's where you see the first of the lever actions and the Winchester self-loaders. Um, yeah. yeah. So I think, have, have we nailed World War II by this point? Oh, one, one, last, one last point is that the other thing that the French are not afraid of is not having... Un a universal caliber. So your your fully state-of-the-art equipped infantry company in 1940 will have been equipped with mass 36s firing 7.5 per 54 and the, uh, the, the the machine gun group will have Hotchkisses firing 8 mm as well. Yeah. Right. They never replace yeah. the heavy machine gun. Nope. You may have no. you may have a grenadier. To be fair to them, the British never replaced the Vickers with a new heavy machine gun until like the FN mag. Well, they didn't replace it as a heavy machine gun. Right, and they exactly. were last taken to war in 1968 by the parachute regiment, I believe, and much bemoaned because people used to firing 250 round bursts and replacing barrels every 10,000 rounds. Suddenly they got this air cooled thing. And what, what do you mean to fire 250 <laughs> and then have to <laughs> pee on the barrel and change it? Um, people looked to the Germans with the MG 34s. Um, as their replacement, what they used as a heavy machine gun, but the French and the British stuck with the same thing they'd had in yeah. World War One. It's um, one day I'll do a video at some point with th th this, this whole Bren versus Spandau, <laughs> sorry Lloyd, thing is um, it's, it's you're asking the wrong question. It's do you have a general purpose machine gun or do you have a a light, a, a light and a heavy in World War One parlance, medium in World War Two parlance, yeah. and it's basically it's you pays your money and takes your choice, right? And it's a set of compromises either way because if you if you do the split, you can have a medium machine gun that's that's a pure medium machine gun and does everything a medium machine gun's supposed to do without compromise, and you can have a light machine gun that does everything a light machine gun's supposed to do without compromise once the designs are there, right? Um, or you can have something that's universal, but makes compromises in both right. in both ways. Um, and it was something we were going to do. Um, it didn't work out.
but we were going to do a, ver a variation on Project, Project Lightning, but the, the light roll machine guns of Dunkirk with my brain, your FM, and a friend's MG34. And with, within our friend circle, there are three MG34s and none of them run. Oops. Yeah. Oops. So we couldn't do it. And you, you, you have problems with your mags I, I as well. think I need a new recoil, uh, recoil spring on mine. Oh, okay. Which is providing, proving difficult to source. Mm. But um, so ultimately that, that didn't happen. But these are interesting topics that we'll, yeah. we'll deal with in the, in the future. But yeah, mm. the French were running the Hotchkiss. But yes, having, having 7.5 and 8mm Lebel in the same section was... It didn't bother people. Did do that. I mean, it's only two. And then, <laughs> and then actually with the, with the, the Free French late war, um, equipped by the Americans late war, there's a lot of M17 rifles yep. being used by them. And Brownings. And Brownings, and um, I mean, Free French initially were equipped by the by the Brits, um, not so much using their own equipment, mostly re-equipped along British lines. Yep. Later in the war, they're re-equipped along American lines, but with the lower choice from the American perspective rifle. So they got M17s principally. I believe you do see them with Springfield sometimes. Probably. I think yeah. I've seen photos of them with Springfields, but the bulk of photos you see with um, with M17s. The real thing that the French fell in love with from the Americans was the M1 carbine. Mm. Mm. Man, after World War II, when they get surplus carbines, <laughs> you see those things all over Indochina. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I'm not surprised. Yeah. So, let's move, should we move into the interwar period? Um, interwar? Postwar. Post post post-war period. Sorry, post <laughs> There's another war. I'm sorry, <laughs> what do you know that we don't yet? <laughs> Mali, um, Algeria, <laughs> no, sorry. Um, so a lot of the the immediate post-war colonial conflicts are still fought. Um, sorry, they're not um, machine gun wise with or light machine gun wise with the FM. Yep, still. But rifle wise, we're mostly on the um, mass forty nine slash fifty six. Well, forty nine first. Yeah, that store, that store. Right, mainline service. Mm -hmm. The forty four, not so much. It's just the navy, uh, Indo China. You still see a lot of MOS 36s in Indochina. Yep. Yeah. Um, yep. You see the paratroopers, the CR 39 folding stock MOS 36s are still showing up a lot in Indochina. Um, they continue to use both platforms simultaneously in parallel. Mm. Um, the 36 was not really ever fully replaced by the 49s. Okay. That's. Uh that's interesting. And into Algeria, you start seeing a lot of use of the, the Mat 49 submachine guns. Yep. Yep. <laughs> they're all over. Yeah. They're, they're great little thing. I'm sorry, yeah. I, I won't mention the pinprick rear sight again. <laughs> other than that, they are absolutely marvelous. Yep. They're yeah. Absolutely fantastic little things. And the hinge, you think, you think of them as quirky French designs with a hinge forward magazine, but actually that works really well and can be used as a as an extra safety by just un yeah. unhooking Bloop. it, just yeah. letting, not yeah. even folding it fully forward, just letting it hang. I mean, no, and anyway, that whole concept is is nineteen early nineteen thirties. Swiss mm. have have that concept, mm. so True. it's not as if they were inventing. It was you know specifically chosen. It was in a design brief. We want we want a folding mag for for paratroop use and making it compact. So yeah. And they are very, very compact, yeah. and they are absolute pussycats. And I mean, referring to the sights from the, the uh, <coughs> combat experience I've heard of and read, it doesn't matter, because <laughs> they're not using them. <laughs> no. I mean, they're an absolute, pu they're an absolute <laughs> pussycat, and as partly, as we discussed earlier, it's partly doctrine. There's an awful lot of less, there's an awful lot of inst instinctive fire was fashionable yeah. at the time. Absolutely. Um, and holding it, holding it central to your body, and that comes up even much, much later in American doctrine, yeah. in British submachine gun doctrine. It's just, it's just a very fashionable thing. And it, it's only relatively recently that the absolute superiority of, of aimed shoulder fire mm. in every circumstance has actually been recognized. That's probably come out of competition shooting. Yeah. IPSC three gun, things yeah. like that. When the military was dominating it, there was a lot more giving it some instinctively. How come they're shooting better than us? <laughs> yeah. Using the sights? Wow. They always shoot better than you. That's how the competition world works. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. It, and the good militaries are the ones that recognize that yeah. and exploit it and learn from yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's sort of the, the idea that you could actually do very, very fast, accurate fire using the sights wasn't obvious. I mean, we think of it now because we know it. 
but it games. wasn't obvious for a long until relatively recently. <laughs> um, so machine gun wise, we end up replacing the Hotchkiss and the FM twenty four twenty nine yeah, with A fifty two, which is a, uh, a cross one. crossbreed between a uh, MG forty two and a, some kind of pre FAMAS <laughs> a curai <laughs> lever delay system. Yeah, um, which is again sort of feeding off the the Mat forty nine. Keep it absolutely basic. Stamped sheet, stamp, uh, stamped metal, welded together. Delayed blowback. So Delayed no blowback. gas system. Yeah. No complicated no moving gas barrel. Uh, this time it does have a quick change barrel. Um, although I, I don't know what, this, what the, the the rate was for replacement. Um, I'm not aware. Photos I haven't seen like a kit with a replacement barrel. No, I don't see a lot of replacement barrels so for them. Maybe it was just there. Yeah, when, whenever it passes through the armory, we'll just replace the barrel or something. Uh, I mean, the, the, the barrel itself is massive. I mean, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's basically, it's a barrel with some it's bits like, on the back to feed it and yeah, hold it. It's got like an inch of steel around the, the actual hole. It's, it's, <laughs> it's slightly, it's slightly <laughs> Hotchkiss-like on that, in that regard. Uh, and the bipod's on the barrel and it's... I mean, the, the bipod is straight off the FM-29, 2429. Uh, and just as just as horrible, really. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a well liked gun. Yeah, like, I don't. We've been we've gotten away from it a bit. What we were trying to talk about how they were both forward looking and backward at the same yeah. time. The A fifty two is not really forward looking, is it? No, I think it's definitely a product of its of its time. Yeah. Then it, it, it doesn't have a whole lot of virtues. Yeah, yeah. Um, layers of Polaris uh, worldwide logistics who has been uh, bringing guns over here for Ian and himself for what remains of Finnish Brutality as a private event within the COVID restrictions um, and is bringing some firearms for me, uh, shipping to M426 in, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, he's an ex, uh, ex US Army, isn't he? I believe so. Yeah, yeah. and he was um, uh, with, some, with a French unit at one point and they loved the M60s. <laughs> that tells you something about the AA-52. <laughs> yeah. If you've been using that and the M60 looks great. Yeah. yeah. And when I was researching mine, it seems to be a Marmite gun. Yeah. You've got people that loved the AA-52 and people who wouldn't touch it with a brown stick. Yeah. They kept it for a long time, though, because they <laughs> yeah. rebuilt it or they reissued it as the yeah. AAF-1 in still there. 762 NATO. It's still there for uh, light tanks, scout cars. Like Poor that. people who haven't been able to replace it with the FMAG <laughs> yeah. yet. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, but I mean, I've I've only managed to fire mine to co put a couple of belts through before part of it decided to disintegrate. Uh, hopefully replaceable. Uh, but yeah, the the forty nine, the twenty four. I'm getting my numbers wrong. Twenty four, twenty nine. Yeah, it's excellent beer. Has beautiful rate of fire, nice and steady, and it's it's well, unsurprising. It's like switching to an F. MG42 all of a sudden, it's just <laughs> so, It's, yeah, it's, mm. it's, it's going from 1930s craftsmanship to brute force yeah. functionality. Efficiency. Yeah, Not really efficient, but yeah. simplicity. Simplicity, yeah. yeah. It doesn't well, matter what it feels like, as long as it's putting holes that way. Yeah. Um, Handguns-wise, there's nothing really to report. It's not, they're neither forward nor back was there on the curve. They yeah. basically just take the 35S scale and scale up. it up to nine millimeter parallel. Yeah. Yeah. Boom, it's the Mac 1950. And they'll use that until uh, they replace it with the-, the <laughs> Until they run out. The Beretta 92s. <laughs> yeah. Oh. yeah. Um, so there's not a lot to go on there. Let's go back to rifles then. And I think we should probably talk about launching rifle grenades a bit because the French have oh, baby. A, I love it. Yes. <laughs> All the uh, way back to World War I. Yep. All the way back to World War I, uh, which is why the, one of the reasons why the Label hung around so much, because it is a two-piece stock right. mm -hmm. and is thus man enough to handle rifle grenades, whereas the slimline Bertier, Bertier... Which is like a fishing rod in comparison. <laughs> yeah, that stock. It's just, that just, not, just, not a good combination. It's yeah. not, that stock is not strong enough to take the recoil from, right. from, from rifle grenades. Yeah. Um, and it... And it's a it's a constant thing through. So we, we, we retain the label for, for 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 rifle grenade launching in frontline infantry use until um, the Mass Thirty Six is fitted with it. Yeah, and then we end up <laughs> with the Mass Thirty Six with a spigot, and then we're on yeah. to twenty two millimeter, right. what then became NATO. Mm. 
One of the interesting things is they kept the Moss 36 51s oh. with the NATO spigots around longer than they might, longer than you might expect. Yeah. Because while the the Moss 49 and 4956 are set up for rifle grenades, they do not have gas cutoffs. And so they will very easily beat themselves to death launching rifle grenades. And if I remember correctly, there are some prohibitions on actually using the rifle grenade launcher on oh. some of those rifles because you fire a rifle grenade and the bolt just <laughs> slams the 49, back. The 4956 has the gas, has gas cut. Right, the 49 does not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you see, yeah, you see, you see relative, well, recent Algeria. Yeah. The 59, the 51 still kicking around. Yeah. Right, because it's the plat, the reliable <laughs> platform for grenades. Yeah. And they, they loved them. And in fact, part of the spec for the replacement for the FAMAS, which is the HK416, is it, it should at least be capable of firing rough grenades. Mm. I'm not sure whether the upper to lower interface on an AR-type rifle is really up to that, given I that it's aluminium yeah. and, and steel pins. Um, I suspect they'll be using underslung. The, the, well, they'll probably like be else. using 40 <laughs> millimeter. Yeah. Basically, um, there's a link back to discussion vids I've done with Dale about the, the Swiss rifle grenades, which, which were just massive, more than one kilo things capable of penetrating about 50 odd centimeters of rifle Soviet mortar. armor. <laughs> um, once, once the armor gets to the point where you can't feasibly penetrate it with a rifle grenade, you might as well have the underslung grenade launcher. It's just more efficient uh -huh. weight, yeah. weight wise. You, you're then cartridges, they're only about that long and they're in an anti-personnel role, they're delivering a comparable amount of explosive I mean for anything that's that's within the sort of 500 gram ish limit of most rifles that aren't Stunger 57s <laughs> which are, I can't think of anything else that can launch a kilo plus rifle grenade that's a lot yeah, yeah. and they had to the, the reason the rifle is as it is is to launch these mahusive great things with these mahusive great payloads to do these things but once once you've gone down to a to a 5.56, you're down to about 500 grams, at which point the underslung grenade launcher is just hits all the yeah. all the bases because you're not you're yeah. not getting enough armor penetration anyway, other than on right. less well armored APCs. But just forget it. Higher issue or well, issue of various anti dedicated anti tank weapons. Anyway, sorry tangent as usual. <laughs> um, so 4956. I like it, except 10 round box magazine <laughs> in the 50s, 56. So, yeah. what have we got in 56 already? We've got the FN Foul. Mm -hmm. Just barely. Yeah. Because Which they did test. 56, you have just, just now introduced 7.62 NATO. Yeah. yeah. And so you're just starting to get the Foul and the G3. Um, the Sturmgewehr 57 will be around in a year. Yeah. Uh, but basically, everyone has 20 round magazines. Yeah. And it is surprising to me that the French never did. There's nothing to stop them from having a 20 round magazine. Yeah. They just didn't. I mean, you, you, you see examples where someone's done a cut and shut yeah. with an FM 2429 magazine, which mm. presumably that was done by field armorers. Which is, by the way, not as trivial as it might, you might expect mm. because the, the geometry of the 2429 magazine is substantially different. Um, it is an angled magazine. Yeah. Uh, so you have to... Uh, the 2429 is angled, the, the Moss 49 magazine is square up in the rifle. So you've got to do a fair amount of you modification. You're going from gravity fed to... Well, I think that's, that's, that's a trope more than anything because the, mm. the springs are so much stronger than yeah. gravity either. Either way, uh, it's, it's one of the tropes that uh, L4 magazines, so the, the 7.62 Bren conversions, don't work from the bottom because of gravity. But no, they work. Yeah. For, unless, unless, unless the spring is shagged. Which is a distinct possibility. Because they're all ancient. <laughs> Especially if you're yeah. getting like magazines that were worn out before they went to Rhodesia. <laughs> and then you get them from Rhodesia because they look cool with the green paint. Yeah. And I have a, a picture. I, I had an old, uh, I picked up one of the Soviet uh, slab side early steel AK magazines because it was cool. And it, I got it as a collectible thing. And well, I one day went to actually use it and nope. it wouldn't feed three rounds. <laughs> And I pulled it apart, and the spring was set, like oh, completely geez. set. <laughs> yeah. Like, it did not come out of the magazine body when I took the floor plate off. Right. Oh wow. Yeah, the bottom inch of the magazine is solid, 
spring steel. <laughs> Again, we live so in the future this in yeah. terms of spring metallurgy yeah. and reliability. Yeah. Now we really live in the future. Um, I I got an 1945 dated Ishapur SMLE. Um, it was it was cheap. It was missing a few bits, and actually ended up shooting quite well. So I didn't use it as a part gun or whatever. But the um, the nose cap spring had a complete set. It was like. I unscrewed the nose cap and the nose cap just stayed where it was until I pulled it off, whereas it's supposed to go thunk quite positively. Yeet. Yeah. <laughs> um, old springs. So, yes. So, yeah, there's no real reason why they. Yeah. They just. They didn't. <laughs> it's a 10 yeah. round work fine. They um, also. They, they, ta they, they take the modern step of putting an optics rail on every single standard rifle. Yeah. But they never really improve off of what is effectively a ZF4. Ah, yeah. Mm. It's a 3.85 power scope that is German post reticle. It's decent, um, but it is nothing. It's 1940, what, three technology yeah. all the way through. But again, it's still it's still just yeah. a designated marksman rifle. But they use that exact same scope on the FRF1 snipers. In fact, they were still <laughs> using that scope on the FRF2 snipers yeah. when they were first brought into service. Mm. Whoa! There are FR, there are APX scopes that were recalibrated for 7.62, yeah. specifically for use on the FRF2. <laughs> and what what era are we talking? What years? Shoot, that's the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. Now it didn't last long on the F2. Mm. They pretty quickly dumped them and went to basically commercial six and mostly six power and eight power. Um, now, the, I mean, the Brits were still using the um, uh, the number 32 scope on L42s. Fair, that's even worse than the APX. That's that's similar era tech. The number 32 scope was intended to go on the Bren. Right. <laughs> and we know of exactly two mounts, not two types of mounts two mounts. Yeah. So for all you video gamers out there who think that scopes on a Bren were a thing, there were exactly two prototype mounts made. It was not a thing. <laughs> but this is a three and a half power post reticle scope used and until the Accuracy International was longer was and heavier in. than the APX French yeah. scope. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so hanging on to these things too long was was a thing. Yeah, I don't think that French is ultimately the only guilty. No, <laughs> no, no there's, a lot of, there, there's a lot of hanging on to, uh, hanging on to things. It's funny with the 49, they had the idea to put a, an optics rail on every rifle. So it could be a designated marksman's rifle. But we're also going to put a rifle grenade launcher on it yeah. yep. without a gas cutoff. And I can't imagine that the, the wear from launching those rifle grenades is going to play well with the accuracy requirements you'd, of being a marksman. Well, you'd, you'd hope, hope that off. they would <laughs> segregate. You would hope that it will be you're the grenade, yeah, grenade yeah. and you how, are how the designated marksman. Is that? No, and they'll all go into an armory and get mixed up. Right, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, not the cleverest idea. And uh, for, for those saying, oh, but you can charge a load for 10 round magazines. We tried this. You can. You can get the, like the first three out of the charger go in, and then the other two just go. Bleh, yeah. Elsewhere. It's, again, it's a legacy of initially it was an integration magazine. Right. And there, I'm sure it works fine. Yeah. With a five-round magazine, which has less spring tension and is probably the floor plate, with and higher the lips are yeah. going to be differently positioned, and it's just oh, we'll leave it there. Because there's a massive gap between the bottom of the clip, on the bolt yeah. face, and where the magazine starts. There's plenty of room for it. As and soon as you get a bit of tension from the magazine resisting, they just, they just kick out. It's horrible. It's SVT 40 level bad, <laughs> yeah. if not worse. Coach. Unless you've had better experience with it. No. no. I've done very little actual charger <laughs> loading of mine. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, well into the 70s, you've got French frontline infantry and elite troops running 10 shot, mass 4956s. Um, and then France ends up in yet another post colonial conflict <laughs> in Africa. And as an urgent, urgent operational requirement, adopts a very, very excellent rifle, which we all yeah. love. <laughs> but only you own. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, because uh, which one? I can't remember which one it was, the conflict it was. It was, a, uh, it was somewhere in North Africa. Yeah, it was somewhere in North, North Africa. They suddenly start coming up against AKs. And um, with more than 10 rounds. And um, yeah, this is this is. A, uh, this is a, a rumor or I don't know where, where it came up, but essentially they, they were complaining about it 
but the government was saying, yeah, whatever, blah, blah, until someone important got killed. <laughs> uh, higher up in the military echelons. And then they thought, okay, now we need to find a solution quickly. And Manuel was producing the SIG 540 under license uh, at that point due to uh, some uh, legal restrictions within Switzerland. For exports, it's, a, it's an SOG design. Yeah. At various times, Switzerland has been a very generous exporter of arms <laughs> to various people, and at various other times, it hasn't been. Yeah. So it, it tends to go in. So ways. they got a license to produce it outside Switzerland for resale elsewhere. Uh, so yeah, they had it on the shelf. Uh, so they bought um, they bought them out, um, but it was strictly as a stopgap measure because the FAMAS was. In development. In development. Yeah. It was going to be ad uh, adopted, but they, they didn't have any out there. Right. So, I mean, they didn't provide any gear for it. The, the mag pouch was an a adapted MAT-49 <laughs> mag pouch, which is unusable, apart from the steady round mag. Um, okay, the bayonet was a commercial bayonet. Funny spade thing. Um, so that was the first sort of well, two, five, 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 six French right. military rifle was the Sig 540. And it's excellent. It's a good yeah. choice. Yeah. Excellent choice. I mean, it, this was just expediency because it was there. It was yeah. being produced in country, off the shelf, Gibbs, a yeah. couple I mean, of thousand. It would have been interesting to see if the FAMAS had not been just around the corner where they'd gone, actually. It, it would have been a <laughs> fine choice, really. Yeah. Um, yeah, there, are, there are a couple of things which you think, in heavy service, yeah, it needs a bit of tweaking. But From a user's perspective, until you have to strip the gas system, um, <laughs> yeah. it's really very, very, very excellent rifle. I'm yeah. very jealous of, <laughs> of it. We both are. <laughs> uh, you have to go fam, fam A. If we can version. get them, that's the, that's, that's the thing. Although well, there, there, there was an... Um, um, a civilian version in 222. Mm. I wonder if it's still there. Yeah. Plain muzzle 222, but that's nothing a Rima yeah. won't fix. Yeah. It's not impossible to find them in Switzerland. Yeah, and yours is a factory semi. Yeah, not a full auto or a down conversion. Which is a which is an oddity. Yeah, as to why they did it because it's it's clearly a commercial. It's it's production. full military configuration, so yeah. it's not one of the 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 old French law easier to acquire ones in yeah. 222 with a plain muzzle. It is a Full military config, except it has the factory semi-auto yeah, trigger. No fun switch. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> All right, but we're not getting to the FAMAS, which is the best Right, one. let's get <laughs> on to the FAMAS and the fact that French people don't have cheekbones and have laser visions, <laughs> vision and can see through pinpricks again. Yeah, it's genetic. <laughs> you know, it's, you've been through three generations of people brought up with pinprick. <laughs> Everyone who couldn't use the sights has long died <laughs> yeah. in one of the world wars. It's natural selection. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, I will argue that the FAMAS is an excellent rifle and is like the 2429. It is forward thinking and effective without any major drawbacks. There is no like crippling negativity about the FAMAS. No. Um, and as someone who grew up with the L98A1 Cadet GP and then <laughs> L85A1 <laughs> where it, even with iron sights it weighs a ton and it balances horribly. Uh, the, the one thing that really grips my goat about the FAMAS is the sights. Hmm. But the sights are great. They're terrible. He just doesn't like aperture sights on combat what? rifles. I love aperture sights and combat <laughs> rifles. They're, they're, I'm, I'm an aperture sight. Just not those. Yeah. Um, I have to go push my head right down. That's interesting. I have abs like I get that with all the other stuff. Yeah. But I have absolutely no issue yeah. getting a sight picture on a FAMAS. Yeah. I've yeah. only shot it standing. Maybe it'd be different prone. We'll have to get well we we can't because it's a full auto. Yeah. Get it down converted. <laughs> Give it to me. <laughs> get it down converted. <laughs> Swap. <laughs> I would totally do that <laughs> if I legally could. Mm. I mean in fact, we just need to swap the little box at the back. I wish it were that simple. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. US. Um, I mean, that, that, that is one piece of design that amazes me, is the, the box of tricks. If you've seen my vid on how the, the, uh, the, the uh, burst fire and full auto system works, it's all contained into a little wedge of cheese. Yeah. About this big. One little pin. Like oh, that. Bloop. Comes right out. It's, a, it's, it's clockwork. Yeah. Pure but, clockwork. And 
it works, and I've never heard of anybody having an issue in it. And also because it's completely modular, as soon as it breaks, just yeah, yeah. <laughs> but first time I picked up a FAMAS, I was like, this balances over the pistol grip. Mm. Yeah. The obvious place for a bullpup to balance <laughs> is over the pistol grip, You'd not think. there, <laughs> with the pistol grip too far forward. Um, the overall length is fine. The, the, the weight is fine. The integrated bipod works. And yeah. it's a free-floated integrated bipod. Yeah, it yeah. works very well. The, the sights are actually on the barrel, that, and mm -hmm. they, they look like they might be on a bit that's not the barrel, but they're not when it comes apart. Yeah. Uh, did you show this in, in your vid? Um, not. Not explicitly. You'll see it. Okay. But, um, but that's that's a very very clever system. It has a very nice narrow front post that is very precise. Yeah. Yeah. It's the typical bullpup thing of it being a bit. It's a little bit of a short eye. sight radius. Yeah. Um, I took mine to a, a field, a two gun field match, and I was making hits on unpainted targets in the brush at 500 meters. Nice. With yeah. just the iron sights. Nice. Mm. Not every hit, but. <laughs> I was really quite happily surprised by how effective I was able to be. Were you it. using brass ammunition, brass case ammunition? Yes, I was. Oh my God. How this is that like, possible? Just like the Air Force. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is one of those tropes that the, that the early FAMASs won't run anything other than steel cased ammo. Yeah. It's crap. Mine yeah. is a, mine is a 80, early 80s, which somehow made its way to Switzerland. So what I found doing research for the book is in testing, because the FAMAS is a delayed blowback action, um, its extraction pressure is a bit higher than some other comparable pattern rifles. And the French army found that if the bore was plugged and you fired around, it would open enough that the cartridge would burst. The case would burst coming mm -hmm. up. It didn't actually hurt anyone, didn't hurt the rifle, but unpleasant experience. And they found that a steel case, with the case being just a little bit stronger than brass, the case would not burst when fired with a plugged barrel. And so given on the basis of that the army decided to use steel case ammo yeah and the gun writers put two and two together <laughs> came up with twelve thousand yeah and decided that actually early FAMASs couldn't run brass ammo mm. right mm. state state factories produced brass ammo I mean, if they wanted a complaint yeah. what they should have said is that the gun is absolutely filthy <laughs> yeah uh, it oh, is yeah. one of it <laughs> and the hk are right up there neck and neck <laughs> with which is which gets completely filthy fastest. And you know that everybody who writes on a forum post, the AR-15 craps where it eats, then goes <laughs> onto another forum, onto an HK forum, and lords the G3, which craps where it eats. Yeah. Oh, I legitimately mean, does. All, yeah. all delayed blowback guns crap are, are where dirty. they eat yeah, very dirty. massively. You take the FAMAS bolt apart after yeah. maybe running five or six mags through it when we do the yeah. MG shoots. It is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's Absolutely. still running, so it's not oh, an yeah. issue. I've never had it actually <laughs> stop working on. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. it gets to the point where like, if you, if you put your hand within about five inches of the gun, <laughs> it gets carbon stained on yeah. it. It's a greasy carbon, yeah. 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 But the, the FAMAS was built from the ground up as a bullpup. Yes. Using modern technology and the way the way well, it's not even it's not really a chassis, but the way the stock goes together, it's all clearly thought from the ground up. Whereas the L eighty five is an AR eighteen shoved up the backside <laughs> of an EM two, um, and it's got all the legacy issues in it from it from the, the base system having not been designed as a bullpup in the first place. It's really not based on the EM two. No, it's not. It's just I mean, it's just rammed up the backside of the configuration. Okay. That's the trope. Okay. I like that trope. Okay, I like that trope. I'll, we'll allow it. It's. I mean, yeah. Jonathan, it's, hopefully, will allow. Yeah, it. it's <laughs> it, it's it's a nice trope because it's we want a bullpup, but we're just going to try and reverse engineer this thing, and we've got bad blood we, with the licensed producers. We of don't it. know how to make them. Yeah. So so it ends up being we'll overly heavy the way. because they've basically they've just gone like we don't know what we're doing and we're not designing this from the ground up. Um, yeah, sorry, yeah, long, long story, but I mean, you shot some of the earlier prototypes which are based around a, a girder, basically, the, much better The system. L85 system is one of these really uh, weird, it, it's almost unique in my experience where the earlier you go in, it's like the Dorian Gray of rifles. <laughs> better it is. The earlier in the developmental process, the better the gun is. Yes. So it's like one of the early prototypes is literally a cut and shot AR-18 with the markings not properly ground off and someone spotted them. And it's still got, it's still got the little pressed steel scope mount and all, and all of that. Um, 
and it's got a little bit of bent coat hanger as a to, trigger this bar. Is, this is just a proof of concept. Yeah, it's yeah. a proof of concept thing. Yeah. And then they go and they design something more <laughs> or less from the ground up around the basic action. I should point out, and I'm, I hope I'm remembering this correctly, because I read this in Jonathan's book when we were doing the proofing, um, but I haven't actually gotten my print copy yet. Um, that was not an attempt to obfuscate who the gun was made by. Mm -hmm. It was a gun that they happened to have in okay. government uh, possession that had come out of Northern Ireland. Oh. And had, the markings had been half Im okay. obfuscated there. The prior user. And then they just used that to make a proof of concept. Okay, so, fair enough. Fair it, enough. It's still a terrible gun. Yes. <laughs> but the funny thing is that the, like, the first generation built from the ground up, which you've had the, the opportunity to handle and fire, where it's a bit more EM2-esque in its construction. It's basically a girder with a trigger group on the bottom. And then from there, it just gets closer and closer and closer back towards a cut and shot AR-18. And then you end up with yeah. this huge lower receiver that's this long and just th th these huge extensions. And, and it ends up being heavy for a 5.56 rifle simply because they've gone back towards doing the minimum from a from an AR-18. <laughs> No, anyway, we're meant to be You're digressing. Yeah, 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 that is digressing. British. Sorry, I'm doing, I'm, I'm, but <laughs> this digression is to praise the FAMAS as having been clearly designed from the ground up yeah. as a bullpup as nature intended. It is the best of the military bullpups. Yeah. It is better than the SA-80. Yeah. It is better than the AUG. That's not hard either. Uh, the AUG is, is at least a reliable, functional, perfectly adequate gun. Yeah. Um, but and the FAMAS... Built, and built from the ground up. Run circles around it. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Um, I've, I've, I'm always tempted to try or at least mount up the FAMAS without the buttstock and see how hmm. it will go. Because the bolt is, ride, is riding in the rail yeah, of, of the it girder. should work and fine. So you don't want to put your face over it. Of course, the, the, the cases are going to... Who well, knows, who knows where. Yeah. But just to film it. That would be, hmm. that would be a fascinating high-speed shot. Yeah, get. without the upper, without the scalp. Yeah. Without the furniture. Hmm. That'd be interesting, yeah. It yeah. would indeed. Now, there is a buffer... Yeah. In the stock. There is. But the semi auto doesn't have it. That's true. So, not funny, my semi auto so has it. You've, you've got a. So, uh, pro classic. tip <laughs> if you take a military buttstock, it will just bloop, drop right on to your yeah. semi auto FAMAS, and then you have the recoil buffer in there. Which is extremely oh. complicated for what it is. Again, it's a spring within a spring with a yeah. rubber bit and a lever arm and a. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then finally, to go. Beyond the FAMAS, they've finally adopted an AR-15 derivative. Oh, they have a shelf, sadly. Al albeit with a piston. And I think finally yeah. what happened is there were no state arsenals left. Yeah. Yes. Quite so they simple, couldn't quite have the, yeah. we must adopt something that we developed here. Yeah, right. it's, it's a bit like the, it's a, the British situation of, you know, sort of final goodbye with the... <laughs> with the <laughs> but the British solution was to try and build one anyway even though they had no real design well, bureau. When, when I say flagship, yeah. <laughs> it's, here's our final product, and then they just mm. fade. Well, because no one else bought it, quite yeah. rightly. It was like, it was, it was like well, this is going to be fantastic. This is a world-beating rifle. Everyone's going to buy it. They, made a, uh, they wrote a, um, a manual in Arabic, which is just deeply ironic, given its performance in sand in the first Gulf War. <laughs> um, and yeah, aside from a very, very tiny little bit of overseas sales. It was just like... Mm. Sorry, are we talking about the SA-80 or the FAMAS? Or both? Um, possibly both in this case. Now, in the case of the FAMAS, Saint-Étienne got purchased out by a big conglomerate that included FN, yeah. and they made the conscious choice to market the FN products over the French products, uh -huh. um, which is part of why you don't see the uh, FAMAS G2 really getting any much commercial exposure. Okay. There was a brief period where it was marketed. Yeah. Um, and then it was decided that we'd rather market the FNC. Yeah. Um, and FAMAS, of course, without tools, can be switched from right to left yep. by yep. switching the bolt head over. 30 seconds. It's a Completely field stripped without tools. Yeah. That's yeah. What, is, what is awkward to me is the these, these safety and selector, which, is, yeah. which is set up for a left-handed shooter naturally so that's interesting i have basically no experience on the full auto safety yeah, on the semi-auto you've got this flag inside yeah. the trigger guard that rotates forward forward and rearward and the rearward is safe yeah so and that's the, fine sort of 
the forward is semi and full, but on the semi-auto guns, it's semi and semi. Yeah. So. Where, whereas on the on the full, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, you have safe in the middle, full auto uh, left. So easier to. So so right as a right-handed, hand. you're instinctively going to push it that way, which is <laughs> switching it to full auto I or burst. I wonder if it wasn't more intended to be to be. Uh, manipulated with the support hand. Yeah. Ooh, but that's such an SA80 ergonomic <laughs> fail. Yeah, because I asked about you, you, you. But. Yeah. Unless you're doing group clamp C. <laughs> <laughs> which you can with a fan mask as a sight side. Yeah, which you can. Uh, you just uh, got like this and just. It's, it, it strikes me as curious as the Come instinctive. On. Let's give them credit for putting a safety on it. Yeah. Because that it's, is it's, not a given it's with it's the French novel. rifles. Yeah. They'd yeah. only been using it for. In 20 years. 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> Moss 36, no safety. Labelle, no safety. Bertier, no safety. Because you fire when you're told. Right. Gras, no safety. <laughs> if there's no enemy, no shoot, no safety. Right. So I think that pretty much brings it to a that, close. That's pretty much all yeah. the French rifles. And then we'll see what they do with the uh, rail guns in the future. <laughs> We never know. We'll 40 find watts out. So, phase rifle. Right so, <laughs> despite this, what, what are we? We're about, about about an hour and a half, which I think is uh, a uh, reasonable time period for a video like this. So you can listen to it as a podcast or whatever, because yeah. I don't think I'm going to be putting many visual supports. <laughs> um, so, um, despite the tangents in various directions and into British stuff occasionally, sorry, um, <laughs> the, I think we've pretty much explored the whole concept of them being simultaneously very forward thinking and very backwards at exactly the same time throughout pretty much the whole period from the Chaspo to the... With a few exceptions. Yeah. Else, with yeah. a few exceptions yeah. where they... Where they, where they got it right. I think it's been yeah. Yeah. very interesting. We've been trying to set up these two being the same, <laughs> occupying the same space time for a long time. And because of COVID and various things, it's just not been possible, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. We have finally managed it. So yeah. thank I think you we both. should yeah. totally find some transatlantic island and put our collections together there. No, you should should just, we invade Ascension? Just put your collection <laughs> in my collection. That'd be, that'd be easier to yeah. transport. No, yeah. you, you see, legally, it would be much easier to put your collection yeah, in, my, in his collection. Yeah. Sadly, <laughs> awkwardly, as an American, that's true. Yes. Oh, damn it. That was how, how did that happen? Literally nothing in your collection that he couldn't have yeah. in his. This is fundamentally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you would like to know all sorts of more detailed information about all these, we are actually reprinting Chaspo de Famas. Um, later this year, I don't have an exact date yet, but by the end of the year, hopefully several months before the end of the year, um, we will have a second printing available. Yeah. So um, do not go hunting for it on eBay. Don't pay $500 for it on eBay, please. Yeah. I mean, I guess if you do, <laughs> I'll be flattered, but we will have more copies. And they won't be $500. They will not be $500. Yeah. Um, so... If you like this sort of stuff and nonsense, if you're visiting from Forgotten Weapons, we're the team of Bloke on the Range. Um, please like and subscribe to our channel and consider supporting us on Patreon, maybe. Please. Proof it again, we are two different people. We are two different people. <laughs> we are... It's, this seems to be confusing. Yeah. Two people sharing one beard. <laughs> Not I, even. I have more beard and less hair. He has more hair and less beard. I think that's the way to tell us, to tell us apart. Yeah, for now, yeah. Um, so um, it's from the support of Patreon, that means that we can be here in Finland, and Ian happens to be in Finland. If you're a bloke on the range supporter and don't know Forgotten Weapons, where have you been? Yep. Please go to Forgotten Weapons yep. and consider Check supporting out. Ian. And uh, you yeah. can see me freezing to death at Finnish Brutality with my Mosin. Yes. Yeah, we, we are the bolt action boys. <laughs> yes. We'll all be freezing to death. Yes. So the, the Moss 36 at yes. Finnish Brutality, the Mosin M39, and uh, cheating uh, some sort of lead. <laughs> <laughs> it's unimportant <laughs> what Mike's using. <laughs> so, thank you so much for watching if you survived this far, and uh, see you again sometime. Cheers. Bye. Bye.